So I've had an observation for a number of years that when I talk about stewardship and finance and money, it's hard for people because this is a lot of hard issues and there's a lot of stuff that goes on with that. And it can make us a little uncomfortable. And I realized a few years ago that when I talk about sharing our faith, about how Jesus matters to us and therefore we should share it with the people who matter to us, and about how we need not just to be silent, not just to set an example, but actually speak about who Jesus is to us, it can make us uncomfortable. Often points, oftentimes people will be like, can we go back to talking about money? Because it's easier. And I'm developing a theory that what I want to talk about today might get you to the point where you're thinking, can we talk about sharing our faith? Because there's some uncomfortable stuff we need to talk about. And at some point during the summer sermon, you might just be thinking, this is making me a little uncomfortable. This is a little hard to deal with. But that's okay. Because the Holy Spirit works in our hearts. The Holy Spirit works through these things so that we can be transformed into the likeness of Christ. We can be transformed into something new, that new creation that Paul writes about in Corinthians. So what I want to do is I want to start out by taking a look at who Jesus is. Sue just read this beautiful passage for us out of 2 Philippians. And this is often referred to as the Christ hymn. Because what Paul is doing is he's writing to the church in Philippi. He's quoting this hymn, this song that people in the early church sang. And a lot of times, depending on your Bible translation, it will be formatted like a song or like a poetry. So let me just read this again. Talking about Jesus, Paul writes, who in his very, being in his very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross, therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and in heaven and on earth and under the earth, every tongue should acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord, to the glory of of God the Father. See, what Paul is reiterating there, what Paul is summarizing, what Paul is crystallizing is who Jesus is, what his character is. And what Paul is getting at is some truth that was very much posted around, very much evident to everybody who knew Jesus. See, on one hand, Jesus had all the power. And he would say things like, look, before time began, I saw Satan fall like lightning. And he said, I have the power to judge the living and the dead. I have the power to heal the sick and raise the dead. And he did all those things. He showed he had the power and the authority. Yet, at the same time, he was laying out the first should be last. And he said, the Son of Man didn't come to serve didn't come to be served, but came to serve. And he showed that with his actions just as powerfully as he did with his words. And let me give you two examples. If you've been hanging out in church for any length of time, you're familiar with these, but they bear repeating. I want you to think about the Last Supper, when Jesus is there to celebrate the Passover meal with his disciples. And his disciples arrive, and what does he do? He washes their feet. You remember, in that culture, what it was is you would walk from point A to point B in your sandals on dirt roads. And you would walk on those dirt roads that you would share with animals. And so when you arrived at somebody's house, they would send the lowest servant, usually the lowest slave, to come wash your feet. Now, friends, I am just the same as anybody else in this room. I don't like anybody touching my feet. But if I was in that culture... And I walked somewhere, and they said, do you want a foot bath? I'd be like, yeah, by all means, let's roll with that. Okay? You know, do you want to be the one giving that foot bath? Pretty sure the answer is nobody. But yet that's what Jesus does. He's emphasizing that he has come to be servant of all. 
And what Paul writes there, that Jesus is obedient, obedient even unto death, even death on the cross. Think about that. In our culture, when we think of death on the cross, we think of the pain and the physical pain and the physical suffering that you would suffer on the cross. And if you talk to somebody in the time of Paul or Jesus, they would say, oh yeah, we totally get that. But then they would add another layer onto that. Because the Romans were engineers and they designed the cross not just to be physically painful, but to be humiliating. And so if you're nailed to a cross, you're, before you even get to that point, you were stripped naked and you were beaten. And then they nail you to the cross and they leave you up there to die. And sometimes it would take days. And so for days, you're up there being insulted, taunted, things thrown at you, and you just got to take it. That's the humiliation that Jesus is willing to suffer for all of us. And I ran across something really profound this week. And it was really interesting because sometimes people will say something very simple and very profound, and it's one of those things that just makes you think. And what this person had written is they said, look, the whole point of the New Testament, everything there, is that you need to say, Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And that's all you need to say to get into heaven. But the problem is, to say that, to say that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, what that means is you're admitting that Jesus died for your sins, for your screw-ups, for your pride. It's hard to think about, isn't it? You're admitting Jesus died because of what you've done. Friends, what this comes back to is that Jesus was perfect. Jesus is the Son of God. And yet he came to serve. We, fallen, and imperfect get confused and think we're the ones who should be served. And one of the things I consistently bang my, my spoon on my high chair about is this idea when people look around and they say, these things that are happening now are unprecedented. These are awful, and things like these have never happened before. And so often what we have in our discourse today is this idea that this self-centeredness and this pride and this stubbornness is something new. This is not a 2022 thing. This is a human condition thing. If we go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, the very beginning of the Bible, we get the story of God creating the heavens and the earth and God creating Adam and Eve and putting them in the garden. Think about it. Genesis, it says, God said, let us create them in our own image, male and female. Let us create them. And so God creates humankind puts them in the garden, this place of paradise, this place of delight, this place where they can walk with God in the cool of the day. And he says to them, all you need to do is not eat of this fruit of this tree. So what do they do? They disobey. And it's not because that fruit is particularly tasty. It's not like they're saying, you know what I need today? I am in the mood for a nice honey crisp apple or maybe a good orange. It's not what they're saying. What they are saying is, God told me not to, therefore I will. How many of us do the same thing? How many of us, when we say, don't do that, we're like, oh, no, I want to. A few years ago, we were getting on an airplane, and you were the jetway, the jet, whatever, is it jet bridge, jetway, whatever that thing is called. You know, where that thing you walk down and you get on the airplane. And you know, they've always got all the bumpers and everything in there between the, the end of the jet bridge and the plane. And I remember there was this wheel about yay big, and it said, do not touch. 
And I'm like, it had never crossed my mind until you said I couldn't do it. I'm like wanting to reach out, wanting to just stop that. Good thing I have some adult supervision. But we do this. We all do this. You've got Adam and Eve there in the garden, and 10 chapters later, people are saying, hey, wouldn't it be really cool if we built a towering city up until we could storm heaven? Next book, you've got Exodus, where God lays down the Ten Commandments. What's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods. And yeah, when we read that, you can read it as they read it back in the day, which meant you don't worship Molech or Baal or Zeus or Hera or any of these other things. Or you could put it in a 21st century context of saying don't worship money or friendships or fame or social media influence or what have you. But what it comes down to, and I think the heart of what God was really saying, is don't turn yourself into a god. Because it is so easy and so tempting to say that because this is the way I want it, this is the way it should be. And it's bad in churches because we spiritualize it. We spiritualize it to where we say, well, this is what God wants because it's what I want. I was talking to a friend of mine a while ago and he said he had, uh, he had somebody just yelling at him. And he's yelling, everything in the world's changing, everything's changing, everything's changing. We don't, too much. And the one thing that should never change is church because God never changes, therefore the church should never change. And what he was really saying is he's saying, it's not the way I liked it. It's not the way I remembered it from growing up. Now, my friend said, you know, gosh, if I had been a little quicker, a little sharper, I would have said, well... I guess we're going back to sacrificing animals and praying in Hebrew again because that's what Jesus did. But he said, probably best I didn't say that. But there's truth to it, though, that we get in this mode of it's what I liked, it's what I wanted, therefore this is what we have to do. But the reality is we're called to follow God, not our own preferences. Let me show you something. If you're ever at the 8.30 service, you know I wear a robe at that service. A couple different reasons and a couple things go on for that. But this is the traditional belt that you wear with a rope, just like this. And I knew a campus pastor once who made the comment when he was teaching students, because he was a campus pastor at a high church Lutheran college in the Midwest, and when he was teaching students how to wear a robe, he would tie this traditional knot. And he would say, what you do is you tie it on, you donkey. Now, he's working with college students, so he said it considerably coarser than that, but I'm going to leave it at that for today. But his point, his reminder, was that this knot is a traditional knot that is used to tie up beasts of burden. And it is a reminder that you are not here to look fancy and pretty with all your ecclesiastical finery. You are here to bear the burdens of the people. And I find that a particularly profound example. That we want to do this thing and we want to say it's about us. But what we're really called to do is to bear each other's burdens. We're called to love each other, even when the people we're called to love are unlovable. And we're called to bear their burdens, even when their burdens are of their own making. Called to be the priesthood of all believers, because Jesus called us to be a special people. Now, some of you are looking around and saying, well, I've got nothing to be proud of. i got no gifts. i got no game. i got nothing. And what you're doing when you do that is you're devaluating how God has called you. 
We have this beautiful metaphor where Paul writes in his letter to the Corinthians about how the church is a body and we have all these different parts. We have all these different parts that are supposed to work together. And none is above another. The hand can't say to the foot, well, because you're a foot, we don't need you. Or the eye can't say to the hand because you can't see, you're nothing. And for those of you who are tempted to devalue your gifts, I want to remind you it's another weird sort of pride. And it's just as dangerous as thinking too much of yourself. Let me give you one last piece of this. One last part of it to consider. One of the gifts that Lutheran theology has is this gift of the paradox of law and gospel. And here's what I mean by that. You take any statement, any piece of wisdom that God gives us, any command that God gives us, and on one hand, you think, I can't live up to it. I can never be good enough to be perfect in that. But then the gospel, the flip side of that is saying, but you don't have to because God has made you perfect. So for instance... This statement, you shall have no other gods, be as humble as Christ. We are so tempted to make ourselves into God, to be perfect, to try and control everything, to make everything over in our image. And God says, don't do that. And then he says, you don't have to do that. You don't have to be perfect because I'm already perfect. You don't have to be in control because I am in control. You don't have to know the future because I know the future. And I want to encourage you to let go of your pride. Not because I want to smash it. Because I want it to set you free. More precisely, I want Jesus to set you free of that desire to be in control, that desire to know everything, and understand that God loves you. And even when you're not in control, He is, and He will hold you forever. Amen.